Okay, well, this is a little bit overwhelming to start with. Um, I'm used to doing these true crime videos just on my Snapchat story for like the few people that watch it. And now here I am sat in my bedroom with all these lights and a camera and stuff and doing this properly. Um, I don't know how well this is going to go considering this is the first time I've ever really done anything like this, but I'm really excited to kind of see how it goes. Um, so obviously true crime is a big, big passion of mine and anyone that comes here for my Snapchat story or is friends with me would know how much I go on about cases and how it's just a topic that I talk about for literally hours on end. And so I figured, you know what, why not just sit down and kind of record these types of videos for just more people to be able to see. Um, you know, I can have fun doing these videos and share cases and stuff with other people. So I figured, let's just do that. So I made my channel today and well, not today from when this video is uploaded, but today from when I'm recording it and this is when everything's kind of getting first created. This is super exciting, but kind of overwhelming. So to kick off the birth of this channel, I decided to start with a case that even as someone who is like really obsessed with true crime and watches true crime cases literally on the daily, this one really stuck with me because of just the severity of the crime. There's a lot of crimes that I read about that I sit down and I'm like, wow, that is just crazy. But I don't think anyone has really affected me like this one has. And so I've decided, you know, to start this off, we're going to start off with somewhat of an extreme one. Now, a lot of true crime cases that other YouTubers kind of cover come from America because that seems to be where the majority of the bigger cases come from. But this case does take place in the UK and it's not super close to me. It's up in Manchester while well, I'm very clearly down in London. But regardless, it is still something that really kind of stuck with me just because even if it's not in my city, it's in the home country. And that makes it all the more terrifying, in my opinion. So before I begin with this video, I just want to make a quick disclaimer. I've spent a lot of time researching this case. I've been doing it for the past little while. I've scripted this all myself. I've done all the research myself. And so any error comes specifically from me. I'll link down all the sources that I've used in order to cite this video. Though if there are any mistakes, I'll do my best to rectify it immediately, be it through an edit uh, in the description or in the comments. So Kelly Ann Bates was a 17 year old girl born on May 18th in Hattersley, Greater Manchester. Her parents were Margaret and Tommy and when their little girl came to the world they were extremely thrilled about it. Now in all my research most of the kind of information seems to lend itself towards the killer so it's actually quite difficult for me to be able to tell you exactly what Kelly Ann was like in her life but I've done my best to kind of build a timeline and an idea of what she was like as a person because I don't think it's fair to sit at this case and focus on the killer. The person who deserves justice and deserves to be talked about is the victim. So throughout this section I'm going to do my best to go over what we do know about Kelly Ann Bates. Kelly's life seemed to be fairly ordinary. Her family had a really strong dynamic, they were really loving towards each other, and there wasn't really anything too much out of the ordinary. She was said to be extremely confident, very happy-go-lucky, and generally just a smart and pleasant girl to be around. She was the only girl with a family with two brothers, and so she was her parents' absolute pride and joy, being their only daughter. Kellyanne was super strong, she was really smart and very, very sporty. She actually engaged in quite a lot of different sports during her time, though her end goal was to become a teacher, and at the time she was studying in college. Everything in Kellyanne's life was fairly normal, or as normal as it can be for a teenage girl. This was until the age of 14 in 1992. Kellyanne had taken up babysitting, and she was babysitting for a friend at the time. While she was there, she met a boy who decided to offer her a helping hand in returning her home safely. In all my research, I saw that Dave Smith was very charismatic, said to be quite a lovely person, and so when Kellyanne was offered to be taken home, she accepted this with very little hesitation. Dave did get Kellyanne home extremely safely, and from this moment on, the pair began to spend a lot more time together. They'd go out places, most commonly bowling from what I saw, they went out to all different kinds of places together and were spending a lot of their time together. It didn't take long for the two to officially become a couple because of the amount of time that they were spending together. Now, Kellyanne wasn't known to be particularly secretive, so she did tell her mother and her father about her new boyfriend. However, she kept a lot of the details very much hidden. So they knew Dave's name and they knew the types of things that the pair got on with, but they didn't know anything else about him. 
They believed that Kellyanne had met him during high school. All was well, or so it seemed. Kellyanne was incredibly happy with her new boyfriend, and everything seemed great. But as time passed, things started to go a bit sour. Before this point in time, Kellyanne was known to be quite a rule keeper. She'd be back on time, she'd always be alerting her mother and her father as to where she was, and she would never stray away from curfews. However, in this time period, she began to seem a little bit more absent, to say. She'd sneak out of the house and wouldn't come back until multiple days later. Because this only seemed to pick up once she started going out with Dave, her mother's alarm bells started to ring. However, her worries were soon cleared because Dave kept on calling Margaret, letting her know that he was just as worried as her about where Kellyanne could be and decided to speak to her about her tendencies of leaving. Because of this, Margaret felt comforted in the knowledge that her boyfriend was extremely loving and caring and was careful to make sure that she was safe at all times. Overall, this gave Margaret quite a sense of comfort in knowing that her daughter's boyfriend was such a responsible person, or so she thought. Two years passed, and Kellyanne was now 16, and she decided that it was about time that her parents met Dave. At this point, they'd been dating for a few years, and she figured that they were going to be spending the rest of their lives together, so she thought that it was better now than any other time to go ahead and introduce him to her family. However, when Dave arrived to meet the parents, it turned out that he wasn't at all what it seemed. He was actually a 32-year-old man, not a 17-year-old schoolboy at all. Margaret would go on to say that she tried everything she could to get Kellyanne to stay away from him, and that when she first met him, the hairs on the back of her neck stood up. Following this incident, her parents decided to plead with Kellyanne to break up with him. Of course, there wasn't too much they could do. She was 16 now, she was getting on in the years, and so it was very difficult for them to keep so much of a control over her because she was, you know, an older teenager now. She wasn't their little girl anymore. But their pleas fell on deaf ears and Kellyanne continued dating Dave. However, their relationship did seem somewhat off again on again. There were time periods where they would just break up and not talk to each other, and times where they were together and completely happy. As time passed, they seemed to notice a bit of a change in Kellyanne's behaviour. She went from being this really happy-go-lucky, really radiantly positive person, to being more of a shut-in. She'd spend hours at a time just simply laying on the sofa. She wouldn't shower, she wouldn't go out, and she wouldn't eat. She just simply lay there. Margaret recalls one particular event in which Kellyanne returned home with a big bruise on one side of her face. When she was questioned about this, Kellyanne simply stated that she had got attacked by some girls on the way back, but that all was fine now. As time carried on though, these bruises and these injuries seemed to become more and more relevant. She'd come home with more bruises all over her body, and she'd have things like bite marks and scratch marks. And of course she was questioned about these, though she always had some type of excuse to explain how they could have happened. On November the 30th of 1995, Kellyanne came home one day to let her parents know that she was getting a new job, and she was really, really excited about this new job. But she also told them that this new job was extremely demanding, and that there was a high chance that she wouldn't be able to speak to them as much. This new job wasn't too far away, but she did want to move out so that she could make sure that she was there consistently on time. And of course, her parents were happy to let her do this. She was older now, she was pr almost an adult, at this point she could go off and do whatever she wanted. And so she did. She moved out to go ahead and chase this new job. However, what they didn't know is that she was actually moving right into the house of Dave Smith on Furnival Road in Gorton, which was only a 15 minute drive away from her original home. At first, all seemed fairly well and normal. It was quite difficult to get into contact with her at some points in times, but they all assumed that this was due to her demanding job, as she had stated when she moved out. However, as time went on, things only became more and more difficult to get hold of Kellyanne. Her calls became more sporadic, and her letters home completely ceased. At one point, Kellyanne supposedly did send a letter of birthdays towards her family and friends. However, when they went ahead and read these letters, it was actually found that it was only signed by Dave and not by Kellyanne. A neighbour of Dave says that she, at one point, asked Dave where Kellyanne was and she hadn't seen her for a while. And Dave simply pointed towards a window and said that she was up there, briefly allowing them to see that there was a figure up there, but that was all. Of course, people were extremely worried about Kellyanne. It was weird for her to be this distant from her family and friends. As I said at the start, she had a really, really strong connection with her mother and father because she was the only daughter and she loved her parents very, very much. And her friends were a key part of her life as well. And so when she almost completely cut contact, it was just completely out of character for her. 
At a few points, Margaret actually did send doctors and police to go and visit Kellyanne and check if all was all right. Here in the UK, at age 16, you can be responsible for your own medical situations if you wish to be, which means you can refuse treatment, change your doctors, and go to tr uh, checkups on your own. This means that since Kellyanne was over this age, she didn't have to accept treatment, which she didn't. What her family didn't know is that Kellyanne was being methodically ostracised from society by Dave Smith. On the 16th of April, 1998, a very calm and collected 48-year-old man entered a police station. He walked up to the front desk and he told them very, very simply that he had accidentally killed his girlfriend during a fight. When they asked this man what had happened, he said that she was laying in the bath when they had had an argument. At some point, she had slipped under the water and she had actually drowned there. He did state that he attempted to resuscitate her, but it was too late and there was nothing that he could do. This is something that you need to remember because this will come into play later on. He specifically stated that his girlfriend had a tendency to pretend to pass out. And so he thought that she was just messing around when she died under the water. He thought that she had just pretended to black out to gain some sympathy. However, that wasn't the case. Like I said, do remember this because this will be extremely important when we get a little bit later on in the case. After hearing this confession, the police obviously rushed straight to his home. And I'm sure you can guess exactly where this man's home was. His home was on Furnival Road in Gorton, 15 minutes from where Kelly Ann had originally lived. Now, before I carry on with what the police found, I just want to give a little bit of backstory onto who uh, Dave Smith really was. Obviously, I want the most of this video to be focused on Kelly Ann, considering this is her story to tell and she deserves justice. But I do think that it's extremely important that you listen to who Dave Smith was because it does play an extremely key factor into what happened with this case. So 32-year-old Dave Smith was actually 48-year-old James Patterson Smith. Now, I don't know if this is definitely true, but looking at sources, I was told from multiple sources that he was actually two years older than Kelly Ann's dad. James Smith was described as being very well groomed and being very confident, but having quite a volatile personality. He was known to get mad, known to get angry. He didn't drink and he didn't smoke. These are very key things because it was a very important part of his personality and he was extremely home proud. He was unemployed and he was actually divorced at this point, which we will get into. So back in 1980, when Kellyanne was only two years old, bear in mind, just to really hammer home the age difference here, she was only two when this happened, James went through his first divorce with his wife. He and his wife had been together for two years and they had called it quits. The reason cited for this is his wife stated that he was incredibly and increasingly violent towards her. His next relationship was with 20-year-old Tina Watson. They dated from 1980 until 1982, so just after his divorce happened. They broke up for the same reason. Tina said that he was extremely, extremely violent towards her, using her as his personal punching bag. At one point, she was actually pregnant with his baby, and he still didn't stop even then. She actually stated one thing, which will also come into a key kind of role later on in the case, and that is that he had attempted to drown her. This was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back and that was what really ended their relationship and caused her to realize this wasn't good for her and she left him after that point his next and his final relationship before kelly ann it was noted to be 15 year old wendy motter's head now obviously there's a massive issue there at this point he was already in around his 40s or um late 30s i believe and this was a 15 year old girl Again, there's not too much information regarding what actually happened here. However, it must be noted that again, he attempted to drown this girl. If you're seeing a bit of a consistent pattern here, there's a pretty good reason for that. Now, in order to keep this video consistent, I'm just gonna keep on referring to him as James Smith. But bear in mind that at this point in time, family and friends still believed him to be 32 year old Dave Smith, but the police knew him as 48 year old James Smith. So we'll be referring to him as James Smith. The police entered his home and found immediately that his story was insanely inaccurate. Yes, Kelly Ann was found dead and naked within his bathtub. However, just one look at her body made it very clear that a simple drowning during an argument was not what happened in this case. 
Kellyanne was beaten to a point that she was completely unrecognisable. Immediately, Smith was arrested and Kellyanne was taken in for analysis. When they went over her body, they found 150 separate injuries on her body. 150. And they were all on various places throughout her body, from her face to her torso to her legs everywhere 150 separate injuries and they were all done with different weapons from knives to forks to scissors and many more things that we'll definitely get into in a minute the head pathologist at the time william lawler actually said that in the 600 or more cases that he had covered at this point this was easily the worst body that he had had to look over There were multiple different injuries from stab wounds to scalding to different burn marks to scratches and bite marks. It was an insane amount of injuries, especially on someone who was still young at this point. So she was still quite small in terms of stature. Now, just for a very, very small and kind of compiled list of the sorts of things they found on her body. They found cigarette burns all over her body. They found a branding mark on her thigh created by a hot iron. They found multiple stab marks all over her body caused by the three weapons that I stated earlier. They found ligature marks around her neck, which showed that she was strangled at some point. She was also partially scalped. And worst of all, her eyes had been gouged out of their sockets. Not only that, but inside her eyes, there were stabs and scratches, which showed that even when her eyes were gone, he had still stabbed at them. At some point, she must have been tied to a radiator, and also she had a lot of mutilation to her nose, her lips, her ears, her uh, mouth, and her genitalia. Quickly returning to the whole I think they actually looked into that and found out this whole assault and torture lasted for four weeks overall. When looking at the whole eye situation, they found out that her eyes had been gouged out for at least three weeks, which means there was only one of the weeks that this torture took place that she wasn't blinded. A week in, she lost both her eyes, which is I I remember reading that the first time I kind of looked over this case and even as I was writing the script and researching it for this video and I just oh my god I I didn't know how to react to it it was it was insane there's there's no, no other way to describe it leading up to the last few days of her death she had actually been starved she hadn't drunk any water her cause of death was found to be drowning and how this happened was that she was in the bathtub and she was beaten to a point of unconsciousness with the shower head then she was left in the bathtub under the water to drown whilst unconscious which i hate to say anything like this but honestly it's probably for the best that way because as much as she didn't deserve to die obviously the amount of injuries that she had sustained would have been absolutely torturous she must have been in so much pain throughout the last short while of her life and i can't even begin to imagine that and i imagine that something like that was honestly just a release at that point So going into the case, it was here that her family and friends found out that Dave Smith was actually 48 year old James Smith, whose image will be right here, but is probably throughout the video too. When they went over the case, James had a lot to say and a lot of excuses. The first excuse that he tried to use was that Kellyanne had baited him into it by making fun of his dead mother. Of course, this did not go well over with the juries or with the judge or with anybody in the courtroom and so his concept changed the next thing he stated was that this was what kellyanne had wanted that she had asked him to do all of this which i mean thank god none of the jury figured that to be true and they all realized that he was just completely bluffing because oh my god i I just can't even imagine that he sat in front of this room full of juries and told them all that this teenage girl had instructed him to torture her and that he had simply obliged. Even if you want to believe that, that's not including the whole grooming situation from when she was 14 years old, which showed that he had some kind of evil intent behind it. Now, remember a little while ago I told you about how when James had gone to the police station, he had told them that his girlfriend had a tendency to pretend to pass out? Well, this is where this becomes relevant yet again, because James decided to take this plea to trial. 
He stated, and I quote from his exact words, that Kellyanne had a bad habit of making herself look more injured to make it look worse on him. And so he kind of fell back on that whole she pretended to pass out and kind of inflated it and made it seem as if she just pretended to have all these injuries to make him seem like a bad person, which how are you going to fake all these injuries? Are you, you're sitting and saying that she created all these injuries herself to make you look bad. It's just mental to me. Now, the case when they gave all the information, the crime scene photos and everything that needed to be said was so grotesque that every single member of the jury accepted professional therapy afterwards. The jury consisted of seven men and five women and they only took an hour of deliberation to come to their verdict. If you know anything about true crime cases, you know that an hour uh, for a jury to discuss is literally no time at all. It can take days, weeks, months to come to a verdict. One hour is literally nothing when it comes to coming up with a verdict because they have to sit and discuss all the information and they have to come up with a unanimous vote. An hour is literally nothing at all. Of course, when the jury stood up to give their verdict, it was guilty. And James Smith was given a life imprisonment with a minimum of 20 years. Now, on another unfortunate note, Margaret, Kellyanne's mother, actually passed away in 2020 on December 17th. She had been battling cancer for quite some time and she had a lot of respiratory issues. It's not known whether it was COVID related or not. She didn't actually get tested for COVID. However, they think that a lot of her treatments kind of shut down her immune system, which made her a lot more susceptible. She leaves behind two sons and her husband, Tommy. In a slightly happier note, Tommy actually went ahead and said this about his wife. He said that Margaret, throughout the last years of her life, all she had wanted was to go back to Kellyanne, and now she finally could do that. Margaret had been extremely worried that, before she passed away, that James would be let out. As far as I'm concerned, James has not been let out yet. I do believe he's going for an appeal, but I highly doubt he's going to get it, because how could you give someone like that an appeal? Well, if you uh, managed to make it to the end, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, this has been extremely different to do. It's not like I'm not used to reading scripts, but to sit and write the script, to do all the research and try and make sure it's accurate as possible and to kind of create all of this from scratch, it's been quite stressful to do. Um, it's took, taken me quite a while to do. I've been promising this on my Instagram and my Snapchat for quite some time now, um, but it only got to this point where I could finally do it. But I'm super excited to have been able to do it. And thank you so much if you stuck around towards the end. If you wanna consider subscribing, if you somehow find this video, I don't know how you would have, but hi, if you're not from my Snapchat story, how are you? Um, but if you'd like to subscribe, that'd be great. I'm gonna be covering a lot more true crime cases, um, hopefully very soon. Um, I've got a couple more lined up, quite a lot actually, I've got a big document of cases that I really want to cover that will be coming out. So I just have to get to research and scripting and editing and oh, it's just so stressful, but it has been a lot of fun. So I'm super excited about that. Thank you so much for watching this video. See ya.